Good morning, men. So we have uh, a number of first-time visitors this morning and repeat reunion-type visitors for the new series, Men Reaching Men. And so I'd like to give these visitors a, a, a hand clap. So uh, would you join me on the count of three and let's welcome our visitors. One, two, three. We're glad you're here this morning. We uh, are going to be opening to 2 Timothy 2, chapter 2. Uh, before we get going, let's do a shout out. We've got a new group that's just started, Men of Restoration, uh, at the Life Empowerment Church in Portland, Oregon. Uh, there are 20 men meeting at a community center on a monthly basis, Saturdays at 9 a.m. Uh, Terrence Harris is the leader, and uh, Mike Link is your field staff. If you've not connected, let, let me encourage you to do that. And then would you join me in giving a very warm and arousing welcome to the uh, Men of Vet Restoration in Portland, Oregon. One, two, three, hoorah. Welcome, guys. We're glad to have you with us. Okay, so the series is Men Reaching Men, and the title of the first message, How One Cup of Coffee Can Change the World. So, <clears throat> you see these men everywhere. They are so tired, they are sort of exhausted with the me now fast virtual reality pace of our online culture. They're not just tired physically, although that too, but mentally, emotionally, just sort of exhausted with the pace of life. And, and you, will, you will run across these men today. In fact, you are working with some of these men, and you will cross paths a dozen times in the next week with these men. Their lives are sort of coming a little bit unglued. Their marriages and families are a train wreck. Uh, they have these destructive behaviors that keep dragging them down. They don't feel like their life has meaning, like it has purpose. Uh, they think their problems are unique, however, and they feel alone. And the last thing that they think is that you would have any idea of what they're going through or that you could possibly understand or that you would dare care about them on a personal basis. Now, for some of you, I could have just been describing your situation. So there will be something in this for you as well. Or you might be on the other end of this and you might be strong in your relationship with God and ready to help do something about it. So, we're going to presuppose that, for this series, <clears throat> that you get it. That you are a true believer. That the main task that Jesus wants us to be working on in the world is making disciples. You join with Peter, with Paul, with James, with John, Ringo, whatever, you join with all the disciples in believing that this is, this, is the, this is the case, this is true. And so, with that presupposition in place, if you want to help a man become a disciple, what is it exactly that you want to help him to do? And how is it precisely that you can go about helping him do that? That's what we're going to be talking about. And so the, the goal here is to give you some, some simple, doable steps that can help you immediately begin discipling men or make more disciples as the case may be because some of you, of course, are already doing this on a very regular basis. And so with that in mind, I want you to be with me, if you would, at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. And, uh, and uh, the first thing up is exactly how does Jesus want us to help men? Exactly how is it that Jesus wants us to help men? The situation first, what is the situation that, that brought this text into existence? It's, a, it's about 67 A.D., Paul is in prison in Rome and very near the end of his ministry. 
Timothy is his protege, his mentee, his disciple. It's been about 10 years or maybe a little bit more since he first met Timothy. Timothy has been a, a, uh, a disciple maker in the city of Ephesus for about four years. It's about four years between the first letter to Timothy and now a second letter four years later. And Paul is very near his death. He will soon be beheaded in Rome. Nero is the king. Nero has burned down half the city. He's, uh, it's, some say that, that he's using Christians as human torches and burning them all around Rome. So it's a time of great suffering and tribulation. And in this book, Paul says, I have fought the good fight. And then that he's finished the race. So, what the situation that's called this into existence is that Paul is trying to communicate an expectation to Timothy that, hey, it's going to be hard. In fact, uh, verse 1 talks about be strong uh, in the grace of the Lord. And then in verse 3, it talks about enduring hardship as a good soldier. So, that's the expectation. And, and what he's trying to do is he's trying to be an encouragement He's trying to encourage Timothy to be faithful and to remain strong, strong in the grace of the Lord. And then he goes on in verse 2, and he says this, and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable men who will also be able to teach others. So what is there anything that we learned from this text that we would otherwise never know? That's always a great question to put to a text because many texts just repeat other things that are said in the Bible, but from time to time you do find a text in Scripture, in fact, many texts in Scripture, in which the text says something that you would otherwise never even know. And this is the place, this is the place where Paul gives us the principle of spiritual multiplication. Spiritual multiplication. Let's take a look at this text in a little bit more depth. And the things that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable men. So what is obvious in this text? Now you've heard me say this before. A poor message will take what's obvious and make it obscure. But a good message will take something that's obscure and make it obvious. But a great message will make the obvious obvious. So what's obviously going on in this text is that Timothy has heard some things from Paul, and Paul wants him to build a team. You have heard some things. You have heard some things about God, and God wants you to build a team. He wants to... You to reproduce yourself to build a team. That's what's going on here in this text. So, what does it mean to entrust when it says to entrust these things to reliable men? It means to set before. It just means to, you, you, you don't, you're not forcing people, you don't have to force people to do the thing that you want them to do. It, when, you, when you entrust them, it literally means to set before. So you just set the table, and then it's up to the person to respond. You've heard me say this too, if you've been here any time, uh, like the time at all. God does not call us to produce a particular outcome. He calls us to be faithful. God calls us to be faithful, not to produce a particular outcome. And he's looking for what kind of men? He's looking for, it says, what kind of men? Faithful men. So set these things before what kind of men? Faithful men. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2 is a very important text to a man in the mirror. And it says, Now to whomever has been given a trust or a stewardship, he must be found faithful. He must be found faithful. I'll tell you, it's interesting, both in business and now in ministry, the most unpredictable part of my entire career, my, I have, I've had a career now that spans more than 40 years, and absolutely, categorically, the most unpredictable part of my career is uh, who's going to follow through. 
Who's going to do what they said they would do? That's it. That's the most unpredictable thing in my life is just, you know, who's going to be faithful? Who's dependable? Who's going to do what they said they would do? And I have, I have people, you know, make me promises sometimes, a few times, with tears I've had people make promises to me. Never see them again. Never see them again. Never hear from them again. And you've had this happen too. So you know what we're talking about. So you know what a faithful man is because you know what an unfaithful man is. So and trust or set before, take these things that you've heard and entrust them, set them before faithful men. <clears throat> One of the great biographies that I uh, have read is uh, the, the, the biography of Dwight L. Moody, the great evangelist of the, uh, in the 1800s in the Chicago area, the, the, the official biography written by his son. And he tells a story in there that one time Moody heard a man say that God has yet to see what can be done through a man who is wholly and fully consecrated to God. And Moody was lit up by that. He said, he said, said, I am a man. He did not say a great man, a, a learned man, a rich man, a wise man, an eloquent man, a smart man. He just said, a man, and it lies within the man himself whether or not he will make that full and total consecration. I will try my utmost to be that man. What was he saying? I want to be faithful. I want to be faithful. I believe that you want to be faithful too, but there are a lot of distractions, of course. But I believe you want to be faithful. I mean, that's why you come. I mean, why else would you get up and go to a Bible study at, at Odark 30 on a, 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 so early in the morning? So I know that this is what you want too. And then, so the next thing here is, you know, what are, the, what are the qualifications of a faithful man? Now, there's a word in the NIV that has thrown me for, uh, apparently, I didn't even know it, but it threw me for a loop for 25 years. In the NIV, it says, and trust these things to reliable men who will uh, be, also be qualified to teach others. But the problem is, is, is that in our culture, that word qualified is not, is, it's not the best word because qualified means in our culture that you pass the test and you, and you have the diploma. But that's not what it means in the original Greek language. All it simply means in the original language is sufficient. It means being, it just means sufficient. It means able, but it's, it means sufficient. Listen, God did not design a plan that depends on the effort of an extraordinary man. You don't have to be, you don't have to have a diploma. It, it's, it's sufficient. It's able. It's, it's fit. It's enough. That's what that means. You have, no, you, <laughs> you have no idea how this changed my, my whole paradigm of thinking this, this week as I'm studying this test. All these years I've been reading Qualified, and I've never actually exegeted the text until, until this week. Absolutely phenomenal. So what do we learn from this text that we would otherwise never know? That you are qualified. You, it, you are, if you are breathing... You can be this man. If you are breathing, you can be this faithful man. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. So, quiz. What would you rather have? Every coach knows the answer to this question. What would you rather have? A, a highly skilled player who's unpredictable or an, an average skilled player who you could absolutely count on every time. Every coach will tell you the same thing. Give me that average guy that's dependable, that I can count on, that faithful guy. That's the kind of man that God is looking for. He's not looking for the extraordinary, although he'll take you if you are. He's looking for ordinary men 
who will be sufficient, who will be faithful. That's the deal. So in short, what kind of man is this? This is a man who will care. In, in Bible speak, a faithful man is, is somebody who cares, who just will care about another man, care enough about another man that he wants to help him. That's what it means to be faithful in Bible speak, you know, okay? So now, okay, well, what are these things then that Timothy has heard? There was an oral tradition going on, but Paul was writing it down all the time. Paul is our theologian. Jesus is our visionary leader, but Paul is our strategic leader. Jesus told us, you know, what we're supposed to do and why, but it's, it's Paul that helps us figure out how to go about doing it. He's the strategist. So what are these things that, that Paul is passed along. Well, we know what they are now because he's written them down. They're now inscripturated, you see? They're inscripturated. Everything we need to know to be faithful is inscripturated. It's written down. We have a written record of it now. This is awesome. And there are three big chunky things that are involved in these heard things. Number one is how to have a relationship with God. Number two, is how to have a worldview that's biblical. And number three, how to have a lifestyle that's worthy of Christ. So, this is the big idea for the day. And it's a long one. Okay, it's like eight big ideas. All right, but this is it. You know, for you visitors, usually it's like, uh, I try to keep it to 15 words or less, but this is not 15 words. Discipleship is one man caring enough about another man to help him build a relationship with God, a worldview that's biblical, and a lifestyle worthy of Christ. So, jot this down. I'm going to give you a second just to jot this down. And I want to talk. There are th yeah, oh, there's a good idea. Take a picture of it for crying out loud. Duh. Yeah. Actually, writing that out is good, too, from a learning theory perspective. Helps screw it into the brain. So we have these three outcomes, you see. We have these three outcomes uh, in discipleship. So discipleship is all about, boy, I said that and about 20 phones cameras came out. Great. So discipleship, it, it's, it's about one man, you, caring about another man, and that might be you too, uh, to help him build this, this relationship, this worldview, and this lifestyle. And so here, uh, and you'll be able to see that again if you haven't got it down. Let's talk a little bit about these three outcomes. And when I say a little about these, I mean a very little about them. We can flesh this out over the series, but the first thing is, is the relationship with God. So if you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you will know the truth. People will know that you are really my disciples. If you abide in me and, and, and my words abide in you, uh, then you, you can do significant things. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Teaching, look, here's, here's, here's my experience, and I bet it's your experience too. There is a tendency in Christianity to think if we give men the right information that everything is going to be all right. But look, think about it. If just having the right information would make you the man you want to be, we'd all be the men we want to be. Because we already have heard all the information we need a thousand times. Squared. You already know everything. I mean, you've heard everything you need to hear. So we spend, but we spend... Take a guess, what, 80% of our time just inundating men with information. Uh, if, you, if you just do this, if you, if you don't do that, if you follow this rule, this tradition, here's a regulation for you. Yeah, here's the way, here's how we can fix you and, and get your behavior all cleaned up and so that you can be the kind of man that God wants you to be. But guess what? The foundation of Christianity 
is a relationship with God through Jesus, by faith, through grace. And so what we really want to be focusing on, I think we should be focusing on in, in making disciples, is we should be spending 80% of our time with men on helping them have a relationship with God. So we should switch this from the 2080 to the 8020, or is, or is it the other way around? Anyway, you get the idea. Let's spend most of our time, and that's a, you know, just a category, but uh, 80, 20, whether, whatever the percentage is. Most of the time, we should be focused on the relationship. Listen, when Americans have a problem, we tend to ask this question, how do we fix this problem? We're, Americans were great fixers. When the Chinese have a problem, they ask a different question. They ask, what are the relationships we need to put into place to solve this problem? Do you see it? Do you see it? Score one for the Chinese! <laughs> but guess what? Where do, they, where do you think they got that idea? Friday, they got that idea from Jesus. Jesus is the original I, I, guy who, who said, okay, well, what are the relationships I need to put into place to, to fulfill my plan, to make my to fix the problems. Hey, nobody ever faced more problems than Jesus. And nobody still faces more problems than Jesus. So how does Jesus plan to fix his problems? He's going to gather together a few men, and he's going to build into their lives and instruct them to go and do the same somewhere else with some other guys, you see. So the relationship with God is very important, and also relationships with others as well. It's the first and it's the greatest commandment, you know, to love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, strength. Just think about this, the, the story of Jeremiah when he's in uh, Jeremiah chapter 20 when he's been beaten and put in stocks and they let him out. And he said, uh, you know, God, I don't understand you all day long. I, I do what you ask me to do. He was having the hardships that Paul was having. And he said, I, you know, I get, I get insult and reproach. And then he says in ver verse 9 in chapter 20, he says, but if I say I will not mention him or speak anymore in his name, his word is in my heart like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I'm weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. Now, that's a guy who's figured out how to have a relationship with God. I know you want to have that kind of passion. So don't focus just on the information. Be sure to focus on the relationship. Don't just help men focus on, hey, look, if the relationship is where you actually feel close to God, then that's what's going to help the man who's not as far along as you are yet also feel close to God. All right, and then the second one here is the worldview. So, uh, you know, we all have philosophies, values, and beliefs. And it is important to have the right information. So this is the doctrine, the theology, the, uh, the biblical literacy, if you will. Uh, there, are, there are some... There are some non-negotiables in, in the Christian faith. In other words, there are some things a man really does need to know and believe in order to be a Christian. Now, you, you know, like the virgin birth, uh, the, the, the resurrection of Jesus, uh, uh, justification you know, through faith, the, 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 the necessity of working out that faith in uh, service. All, all of these things that are in the Bible, they're there, and they're, they are non-negotiables. Now look, a guy doesn't have to believe him, but he can't call himself a Christian if he doesn't. So he needs to know what those things are. But there are also many, many, many non-negotiables. Okay, you want to start talking about worldview? Uh, Republican, Democrat. Let's just, you, you could just stop right there, okay? Can you be a Republican and be a Christian? Yeah. Can you be a Democrat and be a Christian? Yeah. You see all the idiots that just said no? <laughs> you know, look, get a worldview, baby. Get a biblical worldview, you know? But here's the, here's the thing. Here's the thing. We, we, do, we do tend to make non-negotiables, uh, excuse me, we tend to make negotiables into non-negotiables. 
So look, we, uh, young earth, old earth, okay? We had a guy come, come in here. He doesn't come here anymore. And so I was making the point one day that Genesis 1, I do not believe, was written for a scientific uh, uh, reading of the creation account. And I based that on the, on, the, uh, on the word yom for day, Y-O-M, translated day. Well, guess what? The word yom translates, it could be a day, it could be a short period of time, it could be a long period of time, and it can be eternity. It's used that way differently uh, throughout the Bible. So, so I don't think that God intended Genesis 1 to be read scientifically. I think he meant for it to be read theologically, okay? And so... Uh, but we had a, a, a guy who, for him, young earth, a six-day six earth, six-literal-day earth, was a, was a non-negotiable. I said, hey, look, I just, I'm not there. You could be right. It could be six days. It may well be six days. You know, God could build, he can build time into, you know, he can compress time. He could do that if he wanted to. But I don't know. And honestly, I don't really think you know either. <laughs> But for him, it was, it was non-negotiable, so he didn't come anymore. He doesn't come anymore. A great guy. So just figure, figure out that, that when you're helping a man have a worldview that's biblical, that it's actually biblical. That it's not based on some sort of cultural expectation or tradition that you have that you think is so, uh, you know, uh, Im important. I, you, you'll notice around here, I do not engage in theological debates, which for centuries have remained unresolved, as though somehow now today, I, Pat Morley, am suddenly going to give you the real truth. You know, there, there are thousands and thousands of scholars that, you know, can't figure out these mysterious things. Okay, and then the final thing is, is the lifestyle. So... Um, uh, Philippians 1.27 talks about living in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Lifestyle is, there's so many choices in lifestyle. You know, you drive a new car, an old car, a little debt, no debt, private school, public school, uh, Republican, Democrat, if, you know, <laughs> in terms of party affiliation, uh, Really nice yard, not that nice yard. I don't care what my yard looks like that much. Uh, retire early, retire late. Look, there's no one right answer for, for most of these things. And yet there is a tendency to try to teach guys that there is one right answer for these things. So uh, the big idea here today is simply this, that discipleship is when one man cares enough about another man that he helps him build a relationship with God, a worldview that's biblical, and a lifestyle worthy of Christ. Okay? And then the final thing I want us to take a look at here, I know you care, we all care, but what can we do about this? So, um, here's the next step. The title of this message is How One Cup of Coffee Can Change the World. And so, A cup of coffee is a metaphor for getting together. It could be lunch or breakfast, you know. What I would like to do is tell you that my life changed because one man cared enough about me to invite me to go and have a cup of coffee. And that one event put in motion a series of other events that took place that leads me to stand, you know, right here where I am today. Most of you can probably tell the same story. So here's, here's the on-the-job training for you. This is the thing that I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to go this week, before we come together again, and take somebody for a cup of coffee or breakfast or lunch or whatever it is. Now, okay, well, what do, what do I talk about? What do I talk about? You talk about what you talk about with all the other people that you get together with. You ask them how their kids are doing. You ask them how it's going on the job. And ask them how, how you ask them, you know, how's your relationship with God? 
That's not a bad question. I usually ask it, where are you on your spiritual journey? Either way, same thing. But just have a natural, authentic conversation. You don't have to close a deal. You're just having coffee. You're just, I think most of these men that are walking around so tired, they would just love it if somebody would just sit down and have a real, authentic, meaningful conversation with me. Not, a, not one of those things where I, I, I see it coming. I can feel it coming. I know, the, I know there's an agenda. No, 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 no. Just go have a cup of coffee with someone and, and get to know them and ask them about their relationship with God and see what happens. So, I'd like a show of hands. How many of you would be willing to invite somebody for a cup of coffee and will commit to do it to be a faithful man? So don't raise your hands unless you're going to be faithful to do it, please. This is because this is not between you and me. This is between you and God, okay? But how many of you will make a commitment? Remember Jason Bourne, uh, the doctor, what was his name? He said, will you commit to this Joe program. Jason Bourne, will you commit to this program? That's what we're asking here. Will you make, uh, will, are you willing to make a commitment to have a cup of coffee with somebody in the next week? Raise your hands. Awesome, that's just fantastic. All right, put, put them down. Now let me ask you a question. And this will require a little bit of courage, but are you the guy that needs to be asked to have a cup of coffee? If you are, would you raise your hand? So just to see where you are. Okay. All right, so you, we're, we're, all on, we're all on the team. You just, you know, you've just been recruited to the team. Praise God. Let's, and this is the big idea. This is what you're going to do. Uh, it's one man caring enough about another man to help him build a relationship with God, a worldview that's biblical, and a lifestyle worthy of Christ. And a cup of coffee is a great way to get that started. Let's pray. Our dearest Father, thank you so much for this text, 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2. Lord, we want to be those faithful men. We want to be entrusted, set apart with these heard things and then pass them along to other men as we are able. And we ask for your help this week to do it. In Jesus' name, amen.